are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A clap offering. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. You may be seated. We've been, uh, the last seven or eight weeks, we've been talking about daring to connect. Um, the, the word dare is actually has to do with something that pushes you, something that, that moves you, somebody that, that challenges you inside your heart. Um, this whole week I hadn't shaved and my wife says, I dare you to show up to church without shaving. And I go, hon, a lot of religious people won't understand why I came with a beard. So I shaved it this morning uh, because a lot of, there's a religious spirit in this church. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So sometimes you do things because somebody dares you. And, and I, we want to just have everyone. We, we dare you. We, we, we challenge you. What are those areas where there's a gap between, uh, a disconnect between who God is and who, you, uh, who God wants you to be, who you are and who God wants you to be? A disconnect maybe in a relationship with God, in terms of, of your relationship with God. And the enemies come. Uh, there's a lot of men and women, but mostly men who are struggling in their thought life, in their devotional life, in their faithfulness to God, maybe to themselves, their wives, and, and yet you don't know how to break free. And so we want you to, that, that bondage, if you will, is because it, it will only break the closer you get to God. So we want you to connect with God, with God's purpose for your life, with God's blessings for your life. Uh, I sense this morning that a lot of us, God has given us this much potential, but with, there's a disconnect, and so we are living and performing at this level uh, because there is a gap, if you will, uh, between God's plan, God's purpose, uh, God's design for your life. There's a gap in your relationships, not only with God, but maybe with yourself. Some of us maybe loathe ourselves. We're not happy with ourselves. Uh, you talk yourself down. You talk yourself out of what God wants you to be and do. Uh, a lot of us are disconnected with our relationships with our husbands or our wives uh, or our kids because things have gotten in the way. Um, or or there's an abyss uh, between your relationships, between you, us and each other, or our families, or husbands and wives, and, and, or parents and children. And that's what this conversation is going to be about, is, is daring to connect us, parents and grandparents, and even those of you that are part of the now generation, um, the, um, the alpha generation, those of you that are very young and you're here, uh, or you're part of the Z or the millennial generation, we want to talk about what, how do we connect, um, how do we close the, how do we bridge the divide between mindsets and between generations um, and that we have. So I've, I've entitled this the daunting but doable challenge to connect uh, to, to connect to and with the now generation. That, so, the, so I want every grandparent, every parent to think about uh, the next generation. And it is a daunting uh, th this challenge is uh, very difficult. It's, not, it's easier preached and spoken than to, than to bridge the gaps, uh, than to make those connections between our, our, our grandkids that think that we are old-fashioned or that your principles or your convictions don't connect with their, um, their libertine mindset or what's happening in society. Uh, there's a disconnect in their knowledge and our knowledge and their lifestyles and our lifestyles. I was talking to a couple right before the service and they were saying, Pastor, we appreciate. Now, they're, they're grandparents already. It says, Pastor, we appreciate, you know, what you're doing here at church. And uh, they were saying that as smoke was billowing from this pulpit. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm not that crazy about the smoke myself. Uh, but, but the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we believe in modernizing, the reason why we believe in what we're investing is because we want this to be the church for your children and your children's children. Uh, we don't want it just to be the church for us. How many say amen? We want our youth to come here. We want your kids to come in, in those classrooms. If you've ever been to those uh, Sunday school classrooms, they are up to date. They are modern. They have screens. They have carpeting. Uh, we've remodeled during COVID. We probably spent $400,000. Most of you did not contribute because you were not tithing at the time. Some of you are still not tithing. We're still waiting for that miracle check that comes from you, uh, that comes under conviction and says, here it is. I, I can't live anymore. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And it's coming. I know it's coming by some of you. Um, but, but we've just decided. But, but I want you, I know that this is a daunting. Uh, this is a, a difficult, let me tell you everybody here, this is a delicate challenge. For, for people that are disconnected with, with, with let's say, your, your calling. Let's say you're disconnected with, there's just nothing happening between you and your wife, or your wife and, and you and your husband. Let's say that there's a disconnect because your kids grew up, and, and you've, 
got hurt with your sons and your daughters because they rejected uh, your stance or your discipline or your rules. And there's parents here who still uh, harbor issues. That you still harbor uh, anger toward your sons or your daughters. Some of them are struggling and they're, they are now divorced or they're going through divorces. Our, your sons, our sons, my sons, they better not be going through divorce, my sons and daughters. Uh, but, but God forbid when they grow older, uh, the challenges that expect, some of, them, some of our children are hooked uh, and addicted and afflicted and fixated and obsessed. Um, they are totally in a world apart, a world apart from where God designed them and wanted them to do. That's what the challenge of this message is, is, is the, the daunting, the difficult, the delicate, the delicate, demanding, but doable. Everybody say doable. Doable. It's doable challenge of connecting to and with the now generation. In Judges 2.10, many of you are familiar with this verse. It is what's happening today. And it happened post the Joshua generation. Post the Joshua generation. Uh, that after that generation died, Joshua's generation, Caleb's generation, uh, the ones that saw God's hand in the desert, uh, the sea parted, the miracles, the manna, the water coming from a, a rock, uh, just the miracles that God did in the, in the desert and the conquest in the promised land to have hail of stones uh, uh, come and, and fight for you, the battles, uh, the conquest. But right after that generation, Probably some of our generation, maybe it was our parents' generation. Uh, the Bible says that there came, they rose a generation. That after that, there grew up a generation who did not know, who did not know um, or acknowledge the Lord, nor remember the mighty things that God had done uh, in and for Israel. And I, I think that's the divide. That's the challenge that a lot of us have with our kids or our kids' kids. That, that they don't know the experiences or they are unfamiliar with the God. Uh, maybe they did not have an encounter. That's why we have a camp that we want to encourage every parent, every grandparent. And, and somebody here says, Pastor, I don't have kids or grandkids, but I'm going to sponsor a kid. I'm, I'm going to have our, somebody from Lifehouse go, maybe a, a community uh, um, young man or a young lady uh, that needs that connection. We have a, 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 um, a summer school, I mean a Bible summer vacation, which is happening when, hon? July 7th and 8th, just one month, right? Uh, and, and we want, if you have kids, you're a dad or a grandmother or a grandparent, we want your kids to come from all ages and stages. We believe that God is going to come to the, and meet our kids in the summer vacation Bible school. How many say Amen. We want them to know the God, our God, the God of our parents, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How many say amen again? Here's some of the generations that I'd like for all of us to identify with. This is either the generation before yours or uh, this first one, the silent generation. It was my dad's generation. And he's now and my mom have gone to be with the Lord. But, but they're called the silent generation because they were after the First World War um, and uh, during this, the Depression uh, years of this country, there is basically very little done by that generation that stood out, and they're, so they're called, they're generalized, the, the silent. Then came the baby boomer generation, uh, where just they, they exploded, the, uh, this country grew in terms of its uh, birth rates, and also um, this baby boomers, they were like moving, they, they were like shaking and moving this, this nation and moving it forward. Uh, then the X generation, uh, which many are, are, you know, are the 19 from 1965 to 1980. Then the Y generation, which is often between the Y and the Z, it's called the millennials, uh, the Z generation. I want you to see where you're at, either the generation in front of you, before you, uh, your generation, and then the generation uh, after you. If you're a part of the Z or the Alpha generation, uh, you're it. The, you're part. You're the the focus. Uh, the object of this message is that this church, your grandparents, your parents want you to know God. Uh, we believe that God is ready. If you're a young man, you're still single, you're in junior high, you're in high school, you're in college, you're a young lady that, that you're here. Man, God wants you to, to have an encounter with you. Uh, God wants you to, to, for you to know that he has a plan, uh, for you to have a firsthand encounter with God, for you to not only know that you're saved, but be compelled to ask him to baptize you with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There is that, that infilling, that power that comes when he baptizes you. And we want you to believe that God wants you to, to have that infilling with the evidence of speaking in tongues. 
that, that that is the gateway to the gifts of the Spirit of God, to the gifts of discernment, the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, the gift of healing, that God can use you to speak a prophetic word, to encourage somebody else, that God can show you something you did not know um, and, and that you, did not, you were not aware. The Holy Spirit, uh, just, just uh, uh, the years right before Columbine, in Delano High School, I was a, the assistant principal, and uh, again, there was a, a, someone, that we, I received a note to the girlfriend, and a couple of her friends came in saying, so-and-so has got a handgun, uh, he's going to kill me because she had broken up uh, with, a, with, a, with a boyfriend, which just goes to show that, that she was already in the, with the wrong relationship, and she should have killed that relationship a long time ago before the relationship killed her. So, so the... Man, that was not even funny at all. Uh, but I tried. There was, a, there, was a, there was a joke somewhere in there. Uh, and, uh, and so I remember the, the point that I'm trying to make is that we need the Holy Spirit. And I, I began to pray, Holy Spirit, like, what do we do? I found out what class. I went into that classroom. You know, I, I, the teacher, I gave her a note. Is he here? And I go, just circle yes or no. And then that note was point in, that, in the general direction. So the teacher kind of pointed in the general direction. And so when I looked at, toward that direction, there was a person in a computer watching me, and I was watching him, and he knew that I knew that I knew that he knew that I knew that he knew that I knew. And, and so, so, so I approached him. I just gently put my hand on him. He had a duffel bag. I, I just touched it with my foot, and I felt a metal. I knew there was a gun there just by the weight. Um, and I picked it up, and I said, I don't want to embarrass you in front of your friends. Uh, come out with me. Let's walk out. He does. And as I, we were walking out of the room, and I was like totally at peace and confident that I could feel the peace, uh, the gun, the Holy Spirit tells me he's got another gun on him. I did not know that. It didn't come from me. It's just the Holy Spirit of the living. I'm talking about knowing God. I'm talking about being baptized, about, about walking in the Spirit of God, not in perfection, but you listen. You know the voice of God versus your voice. And the Holy Spirit told me right then he's got another gun on his person. And immediately I just threw the duffel bag uh, to a security person that was outside. And I grabbed the kid as he was grabbing his gun. And, and so we, we, we wrestled. I put him against the wall. He had the gun, made him drop the gun. It was loaded, no safety, hollow, bullet, hollow uh, point bullets. Um, he would have killed that girl and many people because he wanted to go out as well. And, and my point is, is that when I wrestled him to the ground, he starts weeping. And at that moment, I knew that it was the Holy Spirit of the living God who spared that school and spared me and maybe some other people uh, for a tragedy would have unfolded that day unless it was the favor of God and the Holy Spirit speaking to the believer, to a life of a believer. How many say amen? amen. The teacher was a believer. I was a believer. The security guard, her name is Rita, she was a believer. Or she still is a believer. We're all still believers. We're all still alive. <laughs> Thank goodness. How many say amen? amen. So I'm with, amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. So um, this generation, the, the, the Z and the Alpha generation, here's some, some really disturbing facts that I want you at least to, to absorb or, or, or that two out of three of this generation are, are leaving the church as we speak or have already left church. That's two out of every three uh, they are twice as likely to become atheists uh, or agnostic uh, toward God. Uh, and only 3%, only 3% uh, in this generation, the, the Alpha generation, are reading their Bibles. Only 3%. Uh, and the Z generation, the millennials, are not that much better. That is alarming. And I hope that everyone here, if you're part, I want to contextualize what generation you're, at, you're in. And, and then that if we lose the next generation... Uh, if there is a rising, uh, uh, another generation, if our kids are somehow distant, that, that's why in those classrooms uh, we have children's ministry that we are engaging kids for them to know God and know that God has a plan and have them grow. We have life groups uh, to today with, with, uh, with uh, choir groups and we want to move our kids into music or there's, we have a private Christian school right here because we want our kids during the day to, to know God, to know God. 
God forbid that they would rise after you and I are gone, that there would come a generation that they don't know God, they don't acknowledge God, and they've never seen a miracle. They've never seen God work in our midst. And God help us. Enter Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I want to just say a little bit about Nehemiah. He's a cupbearer in the king, in the service of the king of Babylon, the, 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 uh, the, the ruling power of the time. And he's a, a humble cupbearer. Somebody in the trust of the king, uh, Art, Art Xerxes. And, um, and he's there and he receives news about Judah in Jerusalem. His own brother Anani says to him, he asks, how is Judah and how is Jerusalem? And, and they say, in poor shape. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned. Uh, there's, it's depressing. Um, and there's no defense for the city. Because it was right after... Um, the return, right after that captivity of 70 years. But very few people were trickling back to populate Jerusalem uh, or to go back to the mother country because there was no defense. Uh, the gates were burnt. The walls were, uh, were uh, breached uh, and broken. And who would live? How, I don't know of anybody here that would live in a house with no walls uh, or with no doors. And then back then, the gate or the city, if it did not have a wall, and the doors were not strong. There was no security, no safety. And that is what's happening today in this generation. I believe that the enemy has caused ha havoc in a lot of our marriages. I believe that something's happened between men and women in, in, in our relationships. I believe that something has happened if, you're, if you've got older kids between, uh, between our children and our children's children and us, the parents or the grandparents. I believe that it's the enemy I believe that the, the seeds have sown already for dissension. I believe we sense it in the rebellion of our kids. That is different than when you and I were growing up. I mean, some of us were rebels, and I, was, I did my part to give my mom a lot of headaches. I did my part, but, but, you know, but it was within, it was, I was a good rebel. <laughs> Unlike some of you rebels of today. Um, but but I'm, I'm trying to give everyone here a context uh, for you and I to operate. Enter Nehemiah. So he's the leader chosen by God, and he began to mourn. He says when he received the news that the, that the walls were broken and that the, the gates were burnt and that there was disgrace and shame and uh, the, the people that were dwelling in Jerusalem were in humility. They, they, they were being humiliated. And so he decided, he asked, he, God chose him to mourn. And I want every one of us to have almost a sense of mourning and then to rebuild uh, the broken wall and the burn gates of Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemiah, the name Nehemiah means God comforts. I want to say that again. Nehemiah means God comforts. There's a, 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 an extrapolation of that name and that, that, that also says that God's got your back uh, and that God will bring you back. That God's got your back and that God has your gaps. That's the name of Nehemiah or the extension of the name of Nehemiah is that God not only comforts, but that God has your back and that he knows your gaps. How many say amen? Uh, give the Lord a clap offering. God knows that there's gaps, uh, that there's a disconnect. And so here's what he said in the first, uh, ne first uh, chapter of Nehemiah, that they said to me, his own brother, and those that came, gave him a report that those that survived the exile, and there's a lot of survivors here, um, and that are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. I'd like for a lot of us to, to become very sober and very real, very like sanguine with respect to what's happening with our relationships at home, our, our marriages, our kids. Uh, what is the enemy already, the seeds of destruction that have been sown? And what can still be done to restore uh, and repair and rebuild those walls of trust or those walls of communication? Those walls of, of, of protection and safety and, and communication uh, and those gates, those gates that, that, that what comes in and out of your home. Uh, and he sat, I sat down and wept and for, for days I mourned and I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. I want, I want this to sink into everyone who says, my home is in trouble. My relationship is in trouble. My kids or my grandkids, they're in trouble. They don't know God. They, they don't go to church. They're agnostic or becoming atheists 
or some of them are struggling with their, with their identity, with, with uh, you know, same-sex attraction, or with brokenness, or in my home there is anger, or there is fights, um, um, there are, you know, this, it's, it's destruction, there's no peace. I want everybody to, to look at what the attitude that Nehemiah embraced. He says, I mourned, so I wept, and I mourned, and then I fasted, uh, and then I prayed before the God of heaven. How many say amen? amen? Would you bow your heads with me? Would you bow your heads with me? This is really not about a great message. It really, it could be, it could be. But it, it's really about you and I uh, being responsive and sensitive to the spirit of the living God. Some of us have struggled to even form new relationships because there's something there in your mind, and your uh, mindset, in your behavioral construct that does not allow the, for the fomentation uh, of successful, you know, um, healthy relationships. And, and, and I believe that God can change all of it. I believe in miracles. And I believe that, that some of us are at the verge of maybe becoming shocked or surprised at, at maybe decisions that our kids have taken or will be taking, husbands and wives, um, in the wrong direction. I just sense, I sense, I, I am standing here before the living God, that it's not because I know something or someone. It's because even as early as this morning, I just felt, I jumped out of my bed, and I felt, oh God, if, if you would just show up today, just, if you would just show up today, today would be the day that many, many a home, many of our kids Many of our, 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 our families, by extension, marriages and ministries uh, can be salvaged, can be saved today, um, just today. And so he says, I wept. I wept because walls were broken. Uh, treaties were broken. Covenants have been broken. Trust has been broken. The gates have been burned. And too much uh, has, has transpired. Um, and the enemy has taken Advantage of that. The enemy has infiltrated somebody's mind, somebody's mindset, somebody's uh, attitude and reaction and behaviors that have become destructive behaviors uh, against uh, the family and against God's purpose and plan for our lives. I just feel, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for sobriety. I pray for spiritual uh, alertness and, and almost like the, the alarm would be set in our hearts what am I doing? What is the enemy? Well, look at how the enemy is trying to take advantage of the, of the moment or the situation. In Jesus' name, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray in Jesus' name. In Nehemiah chapter 4, then, he says, so after I looked things over, I surveyed. And he did, if you read one, it's, he does a great prayer in chapter 1. He confesses the sins of Israel. He confesses his own sins, Nehemiah did. And the sins of his family, his own family, and I'm telling you, restoration begins with confession. Um, there's nobody perfect. Nobody. All of us have fallen short. I pray that most men realize that. I pray that most women realize that, that, that if you're looking for perfection in your wives or your husbands, you're always going to be disappointed. If you're looking for perfection in your daughters and sons, you're going to be disappointed. You and I need to see our children through the eyes of God, uh, our wives and husbands, the way God sees them. You and I need to be patient. You and I need to be working on, on you. Because you, 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 and me. I am the number one obstacle. I am the number one reason. If there is any disorder, if there is any chaos uh, in the Gonzalez residence, I am first responsible. And the only person I can work on is on me. And, and my mindset. And, and what I do. Uh, and then I pray that that will influence uh, Linda. And then the kids to be able to, all of them, uh, just walk uh, under the canopy and the construct, the confidence, the keeping of God's will for their lives. And so he says, I look things over. And then I stood up and I spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. And he said three things. Number one, don't be afraid of your enemies. Don't be afraid of the devil. Uh, don't be afraid of what the enemy is doing in society, the culture, uh, um, number one. Number two, he says, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord, and I want you to remember how great and how awesome God is. Uh, don't sh sell God short. Uh, don't don't uh, magnify the problem and diminish God. I want, you, I want you to magnify God. 
I want you to remember how great he is and then watch how little your problem becomes. I'll say, don't magnify the problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, pastor, if you just knew what my husband did or my wife is doing or my kids. Don't magnify the problem. Uh, magnify the greatness of your God. Just see how great, how awesome, how powerful, uh, how mighty, how faithful uh, God is. And if you magnify the greatness of your God, you're, the, the, the situation that you're going through becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because there's nothing too difficult for God. How many say amen? amen? The third thing that he does here, he says, I want you to fight. Huh? I want you to fight. I, I want to say this again. He says, don't be afraid. Uh, remember how great your God is, the greatness and the goodness of your God. And then he says, I want you to fight. Everyone say fight. Uh, I, I want you to fight. He, he, he just emboldens. I, I want you to fight for what, Pastor? I want you to fight for your family. I want you to fight for your family. Right now, I want you to, and your spirit says, I will not lose my home. I will not lose my man. I want you to fight. He says, I want you to fight for your sons and your daughters. I want you to fight for your wives and your husbands. That's what he says. I want you to fight for your home. Uh, because if you just relent, if you say, oh, well, and even if, especially if you're one of the principal, uh, if you're one of the provocateurs, if you're, if you're at fault and you know that you're the root cause or that in your life there's gaps, there's a disconnect between faithfulness, between walking in the fear and the reverence of God, mister or sister. And I want you to, to, to go into battle and know that, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not you, it's, it's the spirits. It's, it's principalities and it's powers and spirits in the air. That's who you're wrestling. It, it's the devil. It's the enemy. It's your flesh. It's your fallen nature. You, I want you to fight you. I, I want you to get real with yourself. I want you to get sober. And I want you to look at yourself and, and look at the number one culprit and just look at yourself in the mirror and know that you've got to fight you and your flesh and your temptation and your, your giving in and your false justifications and just kind of putting a, an image and, and projecting. And after a while, that gets, that gets really, really, um, uh, it, it just gets late at night. It just gets old. It gets stale. Um, and I want you to fight. So fight for your families. Fight for your sons that are wayward, that are not coming to church or that are, look, are looking like, uh-oh, you know, Junior is beginning to look more like the father. God, it concerns me. I was supposed to be funny, but maybe not in this context. Fight for your daughters, every family. I've got three daughters. It is scary. What is happening in our society, it is scary. But Nehemiah says, don't be afraid of the enemy. My wife and I were just watching something normal, a family or almost a family channel, and, and then just what comes out even in the commercials. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a PG movie, but the commercials are rated R. I'm not kidding. I, I mean, just, just, just same-sex kissing and, and two guys or two women. And, uh, you know, even the, oh, I, I, just, I don't even want to get into it. Uh, so I turned off the television immediately and then turned it on one minute after uh, the commercial. That's better. My humor is coming back because... <laughs> So here we go. Three principles. I hope you got your notes. Three principles. Fight. You got to fight for this generation. Fight for your generation and the next to come, the now generation. We call it the next generation, the X generation, the alpha generation, our kids, our grandkids. I want you to fight. Uh, so how do I fight, Pastor? So survey. So, so um, one of our pastors, you know, Pastor George Garza in one of our campuses, our Coachella Valley camp, he, did a, he passed out a survey to their youth group. And uh, he says, and they named that survey, What I Wish My Parents Knew. What I Wish My Parents Knew. Here's it is, parents. Watch this. And I'm going to see if I can catch up here on some of the, the ones I don't have here. But they said uh, that even though my actions uh, don't show it, even though my actions don't show it, I believe I, I miss. I desperately want to please them. Yeah, even though my actions don't show it, I want to desperately please them and be accepted by them. Now watch what, what, what I wish my parents knew, how much I love them even though I don't always say or show it. Uh, I wish my parents knew 
uh, that when they wouldn't let me date that guy, it's a lady, a girl, that I acted mad. But I was really thankful that they were fighting for me. I wish my parents knew that instead of threatening to punish me, they needed to follow through and do it. Look at what our teenagers, the, the alpha generation, instead of just threats, oh, you're going to get in trouble, oh, et cetera, et cetera. Would you do something about it? I mean, don't kill the kid. I mean, short of killing the kid. If you do, no, never mind, never mind. I'll cover for you. I'll write a good letter to the judge. If you tithe, if you tithe. If not, chale con ese jale, no way. I'll look at the record. I wish my parents knew that when I, saw, when I see them fight all the time, it messes me up. When I see my parents fight all the time, it messes me up. This, this one kid wrote that their impacts, I wish my parents knew that, the, the, that their words impact me more than anybody other, uh, anyone else's words. I wish my parents knew I wanted to open up to them about my mistakes. I know they're not, they're not willing to. I wish my parents would open up, that they would allow me to talk about my mistakes. I wish my parents knew the evil I face every day. I wish my parents knew the fear I hide behind my rebellion, behind my rebellion. I wish my parents knew how hard it is to stay pure. I wish my parents knew. And, and I want to just have you guys. So Nehemiah says this, don't be afraid of your enemies. Remember the Lord, how great and how awesome. Uh, and then fight. Fight for our families. Fight for your sons and daughters. Mister, fight for your wife. Um, a lot of them just want to know that they're willing to fight for you. For, for you, they're just, they just want to know. They might pretend that they don't love you or want you. They just want to know whether you're willing to fight for them. Same thing for a lot of our sisters. Would you let your husband know? I know he doesn't deserve a second. Okay, a third. Okay, a fourth chance. I know that. But let me give you some comfort, sister. In heaven, you won't have to marry him in heaven. You're free from the guy. But endure. Just tolerate him for right now. He helps with the bills, I hope, right? Right? He can help you with Junior. Later on, you're going to need somebody to lean on, sister. So don't get, be so quick to get rid of the guy yet. In heaven, you won't have to even have, you won't even have your mansion next to him. It'll be in a different neighborhood. Come on, people. That's spiritual. It is spiritual. It's true. It's, 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 yeah. So let me finish now. Let me finish now that the worship team is here. You guys be on standby. No, just because just I don't want you to wait. Just, 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 because I still have half an hour to go. And, and I'm preaching to two or three of you guys that are standing right there. So, Pastor, what do we do? Look, so, 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 so Nehemiah prayed and fasts. So, number one thing I want you to do is I want you to pray for our children. I want you to pray for them to revere and, and fear God. It's the fear of the Lord, by the way, that, that, that is going to keep our kids from from doing drugs and alcohol and, and going into a sexual lifestyle that, that it will destroy them. It's the fear of God. It's, it's the reverence for the things of God. So if you and I pray that they reverence God, that, that they honor and they respect God, and that they fear God, um, the Bible says that the reverence and the fear of God are the foundation and the source of all wisdom. Of all wisdom is the fear of God. Knowing God results in every kind of understanding. Knowing God. Proverbs 9, 10. So let's pray for our kids and our kids' kids to reverence, to revere, if you will, and fear God. Number two, all of us, let's pray and fast for them to be surrounded with divine favor. For, for there to be a canopy, a shield, a hedge, a firewall of divine favor. Because this divine favor... Uh, Psalm 512, uh, for you bless the godly. The psalmist is saying, God, I know you bless the godly. Oh Lord, you surround them with your favor and a shield of love 
a shield of love. So let's pray for God to surround our kids, our children, um, with divine favor, uh, with a hedge of protection. How many say amen? Let's pray and fast, fast uh, for God to bring them godly, formative relationships. For God to pray that God would bring our children, no matter where they're at, some of them are already adults, some of them maybe have children of their own, but there are good friendships that are formative, that are divinely orchestrated. Uh, all of us have been part of that. I, I, I love to share my seventh grade uh, science teacher was there part-time. Um, you know, I was misbehaving in a moment. Her name is Mrs. Anderson. I hope she's still alive. Uh, Mrs. Anderson picks up the phone because I was, I was a rascal. I was not the best kid. Uh, you know, I never went into the world, but, but I was a good, um, I was selfish. I was a liar. I was a thief uh, with like, like I, 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 I don't want to tell you what else I did because it's none of your business. Okay. Tell me your secrets and I'll tell you mine. And, and the chief picks up the phone back then. Was just, she dials my mom. She looks up the, the records that she dials. And my mom knew enough English to know I was in trouble. <laughs> and if I could, if, it was, if I had her permission, she wanted, if, she, if I had my permission, do I have your permission to have, you know, a Saul to stay after school? And my mom says, yes, and beat him. Like, well, like what? And beat him. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. My, my mom says, pegele. You know, like pegele. Pegele is like Greek and, and Hebrew, guys, for, for those of you that don't know Spanish. Pegele means to give them a beat down and then some. My mom was never in favor of the you can't spank rule in the school. My mom went with signs to protest. You know, and it's a long story. <laughs> and so it was there one week, two weeks, a month, two months. And so I would do my homework there. And then Mrs. Anderson, Anderson one morning, one afternoon, says, Saul, would you come here? Sit right here. And so she began to, she, she understood. We, we had enough conversation to know that I would go to church. What church do you go to? Et cetera, et cetera. She never told me who she was. Until that day, he says, Saul, I'm a Christian. I teach Sunday school. I grew up. My dad's a pastor. My dad's a pastor. I want to tell you something. She says, God has a calling on your life. Seventh grade, junior high, favor, divine favor. Not because of my, my behavior was opposite of what you would indicate favor would call upon. Totally opposite. And she says, you've got a call. God's got a calling in your life. I see you as being a pastor. I see you as speaking to multitudes. Uh, you're going to be great. Um, your wife is going to fall in love with you forever. I just threw that one in to... Like, 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 okay, never mind. Divine favor. Number three, pray, pray for formative friends and iron-like influences. Iron-like influences. Iron-like influences. Um, speak or pray for formative friends. My wife and I have talked about when we pray for our kids, we pray for their future spouses. We pray not just for our kids, but what would happen if you pray for who, that God already has separated like, like the right person for Daniel and the right husband. I forget the name of my daughters, but the right husbands for, for my daughters. Thank you, Eliana, Kaylin, and Sarah. Thank you. You know them better than I do. That's not right. But what would happen, and we talked, my wife read an article about, hey, don't pray just for their spouses, their future spouses. Pray for their for your future, for their parents of your future spouses. Because they are going to influence them more than anybody else is the parents of the future spouses of your kids. So I pray for them all the time that they be rich. <laughs> Not so much that they be godly, no, that they be rich. Some of them might just take care of us, praise God. How many say amen? As iron sharpens iron... So does a friend sharpen a friend. Prioritize kingdom engagement. Every parent, if we want to rescue the next generation, you need to prioritize kingdom engagement. Kingdom engagement. Matthew says for all of us to seek the kingdom of God above all else, above all else, and then live right. Live the way you should, mister and sister. 
then God will grant you, he will give you everything else you need, everything else you're praying for, everything else you're looking to receive. Uh, um, th this right now, I'm gonna come back to verse number, uh, Luke 4, 6. So here it is. Take a snapshot of this if you can. Uh, get out of the way, mijo. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, leave the church. No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, don't. <laughs> no, don't. Uh, come on, where's your thick skin? Uh, <laughs> so, so take a picture of that, or over here, right? Because it's, it's really, like, like here are the five disciplines. Everybody has to pray. Like, like pray, we still pray when we go to the restaurants, we still pray, and, and we pray at home. And we'll sit down, and sometimes Linda calls all of us, or I'll call them, and says, let's pray, let's gather, let's pray. We'll have everyone take turns, we pray. Everybody needs to be somehow having a scriptural reading plan well, read the scriptures together. But here's the big one, the easiest one to do, and yet it's the most like inconsistent is come to church together. Bring your kids. There's something happening with your kids or your grandkids right over there in the, in the, in the uh, classrooms. But come to church. Engage in worship. Listen to a message. Uh, sharpen your tools. Uh, dust yourself off. Uh, open your heart. Ask God to help you see the reality. Uh, help them have you hear what God is saying and you can hear from God and everything most almost everything that God has done in my life has happened in church I got I was born again in Sunday school I was baptized in church I was baptized with the Holy Spirit in an evening service I received God's calling at church on a Sunday morning like this God just spoke to my heart and I knew at 17 that God was calling me uh, to the ministry so so attend church serve together practice generosity together teach your kids how to give um, Linda often says, hey, you know, do we have ones? Because she doesn't want to give our kids fives and tens and twenties to give to God. And I said, hon, all I have is twenties or hundred dollar bills. I'm sorry. <laughs> so our kids don't give because all I have is hundreds. <laughs> so, no, we want them to learn how to give. How many say amen? amen. So, so, so every once in a while they have a birthday, every once in a while... Some of you maybe give them a gift or somebody gives them a gift and we have them tithe. We, we have them tithe, whatever it is. Some of you haven't given our kids a gift in a long time. Sorry, boy, this is terrible. This is a bad message, I'm telling you. <laughs> so pray, read, attend, serve, practice generosity. Everybody, if we, if we want to reach the next generation and, and together, together, and when together is not possible, then you, you stand. You deliver for you, uh, and because you and God are a majority if you're someone who is single. Um, and then, let me just finish here. I want to uh, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, uh, for he who promised is faithful. Um, and let us, let us consider how we may spur one another uh, onward or on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, not giving up meeting together as some have uh, in habit of doing. I want to go back to this verse uh, because Jesus attended church. I want to say that again. Jesus attended church. Um, I'll say that you should attend church every Sunday, everybody, every Sunday, and not look for reasons or excuses. And I know the gas is expensive. But if, and I say this sincerely, if you can't afford gas, let us know. And I say it sincerely. Um, we'll see if you've been giving and if you've been giving... Terrible. No, let us know. Uh, I have Paco, Paco, I'm sorry. But that guy right there, or Andrew, okay? I'm not kidding. Don't come to me because. But we don't want you to stay home. How many say amen? All right, let me finish now. Let me, let me land this plane that's already like smoke. There's smoke. Okay, now guys, come help me. So you need to participate, you need to engage, you need to involve yourself in the development of our kids and our grandkids. You need to take personal responsibility. You can't blame, you can't say the church, you can't say the government, you can't blame it on the schools. Everyone here needs to participate uh, in the development of the now generation. So make your faith and family your priority and your legacy. Make your faith and your family your priority and your legacy. So Joshua, it's supposed to say Joshua, but, uh, but if, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to some of you, some of us, then choose for yourself, Joshua says, this day whom you will serve.
but as for me and my household, but yeah, we will serve the Lord. How many say amen? If that's you, if that's you, let's give the Lord a clap offering. But as for me and my kids and my daughters, even if they're already estranged, even if they're already not serving God, even if they're already adults, you can, you can declare God's promises. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household shall be saved. How many say amen? But as for you, that's all of us, continue in what you have learned and, what, and have become convinced of because you know those uh, from whom you have learned it. So real quickly, the five ways to develop the now generation, the, the future generation. So they need, to, they need to see you and me love God. So if you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and you show it, you demonstrate it, your love for God with all your heart and all your strength, Dad and mom, if you love God, and then you, you love others the way you love yourselves, I'm telling you, that will leave such an impression on your kids. If you love God, uh, if, if, if you model it, if you demonstrate it, and then live right, dad or mom, there's nothing that, that kind of uh, kind of uh, you know takes away our children's desire to serve God is when you and I don't model what we say. So, so you've got to live right. Not only love God, live right. Live righteously, not perfectly, but, but be, be somebody who, who uh, admits mistakes and failures. Be somebody who's quick to ask your kids and your grandkids for forgiveness. Mijito, mija, uh, I want to apologize. Uh, I want to apologize. I made a mistake. Whether it's a lot of years ago or recently or in your last uh, uh, family dinner. But, but people who live out of pride and never admit mistakes... Nobody wants a relationship. Very few people want to have a relationship. Live right. Lead by example. How many say amen? Lead by example. Lead by example. Um, the, the fourth L is learn every day. Keep growing. Keep growing. And then leverage your faith. What does that mean? Leverage your faith. Nothing is impossible for them who believe. Nothing is impossible for God. Faith is your greatest weapon. Faith is your greatest weapon. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 4, 17, that he is our father. It's talking about Abraham in the sight of God, in whom he believed. Abraham believed in, in God. The, uh, and, and he believed in the God who gives life to the dead. He gives life to the dead. And Abraham believes in the God that calls the things that are not as though they were. So leverage your faith. Uh, leverage your faith. How many say amen? Then at, at last here, would you stand up with me? Worship team, would you help me? You've got to be an example. You've got to be available. Be positive. Be an example. Make yourself available and remain positive. Or would you lift up your hands just a couple of minutes with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help me, worship team. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Just as you're standing there, my, my responsibility right now, I sense, is if anyone says, Pastor, I, I want to right now, I want to draw closer to God. I, I want to make a confession. I want to confess that I'm a sinner. I want to confess that I want, I want to be saved. I want the certainty of being born again. Uh, if everyone just puts your hands down just for one minute, everyone, just your hands then if that's you, would you raise up your hand because I want to pray with you and for you. You want to say, Pastor, I want to make sure that I want to be, that I'm born again, that I'm, I'm standing in righteousness with God. I see your hands back there. I see hands. I see your hand. Thank you for the courage, young man, of just raising your hand. This, this is the, the most sacred, most solemn moment of this service. Hallelujah. Would everyone repeat this prayer, especially if you raised your hand? Or if you raised it in your heart, would you repeat this prayer? And then church, let's help them. Everyone say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I need you. I need salvation and the forgiveness of all my sins. Thank you for Christ Jesus that died on that cross, that today I am saved by faith through grace. Thank you for new life. Thank you for favor. By your help, I will serve you, the living God, to the best of my ability. So help me, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a copy and help me.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have no doubt in my heart that today God ministered to you through worship or the word, something that was personal, something that you need to do something with the word of God. So not just receive the word of God, let's just not be hearers of the word of God. The challenge is to do something with the word of God. Move beyond the pale, go beyond your normal routine and watch God continue to work in your life, the miraculous, the supernatural. This is Pastor Saul thanking you for being with us online today. I'd like to encourage you. I'd like to challenge you to give. Trust the word of God when it says give and it shall be given unto you. Trust Jesus or the apostle when he said it is better to give than to receive. Something supernatural begins to happen as you give, as you give with your heart, as you are generous, give and God will see that seed uh, and make sure that that seed grows into a blessing both to the house of God, the work of God, but also your household. Also connect with us. Would you uh, download our church center app? Uh, take that extra step to connect with LifeHouse, Growth Track, and the many events and activities that are unfolding right before you. Get connected. We'll see you in person as soon as you're able to. That is the challenge for today. And then follow us on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook. Would you take a moment to download or connect with us or follow us in these platforms and be part of this army, be part of this movement, be part of this church that God has called to reach thousands of people and lead them to know God, grow together, and go serve. I bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you for being part of this online ministry to the glory of God.